Thank you for tuning in to the Postmodern Realities Podcast from the Christian Research Institute and the Christian Research Journal. I'm Melanie Cogdill, Managing Editor of the Christian Research Journal. It's March 2020, and you're listening to episode 164, which is a discussion about fetal pain and the abortion debate. On this episode, I'm joined by Megan Elman, who is a speaker and writer with the Life Training Institute, where she trains students across the nation to make a compelling case for the pro-life view. She holds an undergraduate degree in journalism, and she has a Master of Arts degree from Biola University in Christian Apologetics. Megan has written a feature article for our print issue, which is volume 42, number three and four, which is our current issue that's available right now with your subscription. And her article is called, What's Pain Got to Do With It? Why Arguments Over Fetal Pain Capability Ultimately Miss the Mark in the Abortion Debate. And we're doing something we don't normally do, which is we normally do not put up online for free any of the articles in our current issue. But we are going to put Megan's article up online so you can get a taste of what's in the current issue of the Christian Research Journal. And you can read her article at our website, equip.org. Megan, it's good to have you on. It's great to be on, Melanie. Thanks. So your article, which has a kind of a longer title that I just mentioned, What's Pain Got to Do With It? Why Arguments Over Fetal Pain Capability Ultimately Miss the Mark in the Abortion Debate, um, you book end with a children's story. So why don't you tell our listeners what's that about and how does the central idea of that story relate to your topic? Yeah, sure. Um, I just realized that what's pain got to do with it sounds a lot like the Tina Turner song. Um, I don't know if I meant to do that or not. Uh, <laughs> the what's love got to do with it. Uh, but anytime we're going to talk about the issue of abortion or related issues, uh, we really have to dig up underneath it and talk about the ideas driving it. And because I work with students so often, I really have to unpack that for them. Um, so it's great to start off talking about a story because stories give at kind of the, the theme of identity, which is, I would say, kind of undergirding a lot of what we're talking about when it comes to the wrongness of abortion. And in this case, I chose Max Licato's little children's book, You Are Special, which is one of my personal favorites. My kids have loved it. I've met teachers who read it aloud to their classes. It's a fantastic story with a great big, um, you know, it, it's packed full of truth. And uh, so the, the premise of the story is that it's about this little people group called the Wemmicks, and they are little wooden puppet people. And they have kind of this strange way of life. Um, they, they kind of watch each other all day long. And each of the Wemmicks has uh, like, a, like a box on their belt full of stickers. And so for the Wemmicks who perform exceptionally well, like the ones who are great athletes or the ones who can speak well or sing well or who look really shiny and pretty because maybe they have some brand new paint on their, you know, their person or whatever, um, the other Wemmicks will put gold star stickers on those Wemmicks. But there are some Wemmicks who aren't as talented as those Wemmicks, and the main character is one of those. His name is Punchinello, and Punchinello, he tries to do all those things, but he really just kind of misses the mark. Like He tries to run fast, but he's clumsy. He tries to explain why he fell down, but he trips over his words, and he's all dinged up kind of thing. So he doesn't have any gold stars on him. He has gray dots all over him. Um, and so what he begins to believe about himself in the beginning of the story is that he's just not a very good Wemmick. And he doesn't want to go out and be around the other Wemmicks. And um, that's kind of the point where I, where I usually leave students or audiences hanging because there's a great big idea there. Punchinello lives in a society where some of his kind just don't matter as much as the others. And that is the driving issue behind you know, what's going on with abortion. That's the idea in play. Some human beings just don't matter as much as others. Um, but ideas can be a very dangerous thing, as you well know, because at Christian Research Journal, that's something that, you know, the writers and contributors traffic in all the time is talking about dangerous ideas and the consequences of those. So that is the idea lurking kind of beneath the abortion issue. So specifically to the topic of your article about fetal pain, why do you think the arguments over fetal pain has garnered so much attention lately? And why don't you explain for our listeners what you mean by fetal pain? Yeah, sure. Um, well, when we're talking about fetal pain, we're, we're talking about the capability of the fetus to feel pain in the womb, particularly when abortion is happening. 
uh, because some of the methods that are used to do abortions um, would be painful to any one of us. And so there are arguments back and forth about fetal development over what point does the fetus begin to feel pain. And um, there's been a lot of back and forth in this, particularly in legislation that's come up. Um, and I mean, the fact of the matter is nobody wants to inflict pain. Uh, in fact, we're, we're a society that is so good at avoiding pain. Um, I mean, I was reading one of my favorite philosophers, uh, Peter Crafe, the other day, and he was talking about the fact that our generations, these younger generations now experience in general, almost no pain in comparison to our ancestors, um, just because of our abilities to avoid it through technology or even just distraction and diversion. Um, so the idea of inflicting pain is a bothersome one, um, and therefore it's come up in the debate over abortion. Um, for pro-life people, it's it's a kind of a step in the right direction to show, look, this inflicts pain to the fetus, to a human being, and that is wrong, which makes anyone uncomfortable to think about. Um, for pro-choicers, uh, where they come down on it is that actually the what the fetus is able to experience is a little different than what you're calling pain. Um, so that's kind of where the debate lies. And really, it started coming up in headlines around 2013, I think was the first time the Pain-Capable Unborn Child Protection Act was introduced in Congress for the first time. It's come up again several times. Um, it has not um, gone all the way through yet because of lack of, of votes for the filibuster that it required. But um, here it is an election year. So here we are arguing over this again. So you specifically cite a Salon.com article from a few years ago in which the author accuses um, pro-lifers of really doing phony science, you mm -hmm. know, especially when it comes to the topic of fetal pain. They're using that issue to manipulate people. So how should pro-lifers respond to that? specific charge when it comes to conversations about fetal pain? Yeah, well, let's, we have to get specific about fetal pain first, um, because that, that's where the author was really going with, again, with the back and forth of the debate over fetal pain. Um, this author is saying the science shows that the unborn can't experience pain in the way that you and I do. So these pro-lifers who are pushing for this pain-capable legislation are really just, they're doing phony science. They're lying to us. The doctor that was cited in that salon piece, who is an abortion provider herself, um, explained it this way, and I have a quote right here. She said, the part of the brain and nervous system that perceives pain is not connected to the part of the body that receives pain signals until approximately 26 weeks or later than these fetal pain bills are. Most of them, um, I think there are about 24 now, 24 different states that have passed fetal pain bills, at least as of last year. And the cutoff for them is 20 weeks. Um, and they limit abortion after that, after that point because of uh, the infliction of pain. So this doctor is saying that the mechanisms that are needed to be in place for the unborn to experience pain are not really there. Now, her assumption is that um, a human being at that stage of development needs a mature cerebral cortex, which is what like you and I have, Melanie, um, in order for it to experience pain in a meaningful way. But the research that I looked into or the scientific research that's been done um, show that there are children and adults who are born with either no cerebral cortex um, or at least a minimally functioning one, and they do experience pain. Um, and so that the, the research that kind of counters that doctrine, the salon piece is based more on evidence that the mechanisms that are necessary for the fetus to experience pain may not be the same that we need to experience pain given their stage of development. Um, and as of the time of the article, that research was indicating that those pain mechanisms are already in place by 20 weeks or even a little bit before. And in fact, this is interesting, um, there was an article that came out very recently in the Journal of Medical Ethics, um, and I'll name the, the authors here, Stuart Derbyshire and John Bachman, both of whom, by the way, disagree on the abortion issue, but they were interested in being intellectually honest about um, the capability of the fetus to feel pain. And their research points to the possibility that um, the necessary features in place for the fetus to experience pain are there by 12 weeks or as early as 12 weeks. Um, so. There is plenty of research out there that undermines this assumption that the fetus can't experience pain like you and me until after 24 or 26 weeks, as some would say. So what about the other 
charge, you know, the author saying that this is phony science that, you know, basically yeah. Christians and the pro-life position is generally anti-science. Oh yeah. Well, I I run into that all the time. You, you may have too in, in making a scientific case. It's absolutely false. Um, you know, Life Training Institute, we teach that the pro-life argument depends on the scientific response to what we would say is the single most important question to frame the debate. What is the unborn? Um, and science has answered that question. The embryology is very clear. And in, in brief, it says that the unborn from the point of fertilization are living, distinct, and whole human beings. We know they're alive because they fit the definition of an organism. They undergo cellular reproduction, so they're growing. They metabolize. They respond to stimuli. They can repair wounds even at that early stage of development as an embryo. Um, we know they're distinct because they have their own unique genetic code that is different from their mothers and their fathers. And, and we know that they're whole human beings because even at that embryonic stage, that first cell stage, it's the embryo's parts are working together in a coordinated way to drive that embryo's development. Um, and so it kind of counters the way that, that we often hear the embryo talked about as a clump of cells or a mass of tissue and nothing more than that, as if it is a constructed type of thing um, by describing what it does instead. It's not constructed at all. You and I drove our own development from within. Now, these are all scientific facts um, so for anyone to charge the pro-life position of being anti-science is just silly at this point. You're listening to the Postmodern Realities Podcast from the Christian Research Institute and the Christian Research Journal. Today's guest is Megan Almont, and she has written a feature-length article in our print edition, which is the current issue right now, volume 42, number three and four. Megan's article is called, What's Pain Got to Do With It? Why Arguments Over Fetal Pain Capability ultimately miss the mark in the abortion debate. And we're going to do something that we have never done, actually, and that is to give you a taste of the current issue of the Christian Research Journal. So we're going to make Megan's article available to you to read completely free online at our website, equip.org. You can find that link there at the landing page for this episode. And we'd love it if you would subscribe to our journal for thirty three fifty, which you can also do at the website. But if a subscription is not in your budget, would you please consider giving us a tip like $3 or $5 or $10? You can do that very easily at any landing page for Postmodern Realities Podcast. You just go to equip.org, find magazine on the front page, click down to Postmodern Realities Podcast and click onto any landing page and you will find a link there where you can give us a tip. But if something monetary is not in your budget, we'd like you to help us out just by using some of your time, actually. And the best way you can help us out is just tell a friend about this podcast. This gets the word out about all of our content, including our podcast episodes, as well as all of our free online articles. So please tell a friend and they can subscribe it wherever they get their podcasts. Another thing you could do, which would just take a few moments of your time, is we'd really love it if you'd rate our podcast. Could you go to Apple Podcasts and rate and review our podcast? If you do that, you can help us get more listeners to this podcast. And so we thank you for your support. We were just talking about the claim that the pro-life position is, in general, anti-science, which is not true, as you're mentioning. But as the science is becoming more widely known, the pushback from people who advocate for abortion seems to have shifted, mm -hmm. I think, sp especially with the wave of various pro-life legislation around the country. Mm -hmm. So what are you seeing with that shift and how should a Christian respond? Yeah, that's that is you're right about that. It has kind of shifted um, because the science is becoming more widely known. So for most people who are informed on the issue, um, wherever they fall on the spectrum from pro-choice to pro-life, those who are informed will say, yeah, we know what the science says about the unborn. So they make different kinds of distinctions. But what I've seen from the media, especially maybe throughout the last year, um, is that those who are arguing against pro-lifers are, are doing so with the things they're charging pro-lifers of doing, things like um, ad hominem arguments or name-calling um, or, or shifting to kind of fear tactics about um, what, 
what taking away abortion will do to you know, to women's rights or, or things like that, and even even emotional appeals, um, which are never easy on either side of the spectrum. Um, but there's been a real spike in appeals to uh, kind of these stories of late term abortions, um, which laws like the ones we're talking about would limit. Um, but these late term abortion stories about mothers who find out that they're that their baby is um, not going to live very long once they're born, or perhaps given a terminal diagnosis before the end of pregnancy. So none of these things are easy things. They are heart-wrenching scenarios, and I don't think anyone is denying that. Um, and I don't know, you know who's listening right now, um, but, but that this, just to understand that when we are talking about apologetics and these ideas, um, we can never, ever forget that these are attached to real people and real stories. Um, but when we come to these these very heart wrenching issues, and we take it up to the ideal level, then we can do what we do at Life Training Institute, which is trot out the toddler. Um, you know, if we if we had a two year old who was given a terminal diagnosis, no one would say that you could actively kill the two year old in order to avoid that that terrible outcome. And in fact, what we're finding in the research is, um, and I cite this in the article, is that to have the abortion in these in these horrible cases doesn't actually take away the emotional trauma of the cases. Either way, um, you know, a couple or a mother has lost a child, and so the belief that somehow abortion will undo that um, is is completely false. Um, and so, all of this kind of kind of plays into the fact that that what's going on right now, we're hearing more of these emotional appeals and these these stories and things which do need to be dealt with both pastorally and um, empathetically and also at the idea level. But for for uh, the, for individuals to say that that pro-lifers are anti-science in this way, again, pointing back to what I said a minute ago, is is false. So what does pain have to do with it? That's in your title, do the conversations about whether or not fetuses are capable of pain, do those conversations matter? Uh, Absolutely, they matter. Um, And I think I I even say that in the article, these conversations are not unimportant. Um, After all, if abortion does actually cause pain to the unborn child at any point throughout the pregnancy, then that would be an additional evil and and even an exceptional evil to what's already taking place with the abortion. And so in having these conversations about fetal pain, sometimes that might be the thing that would awaken someone to the wrongness of abortion. If they realize, oh, well, when that happens to the fetus, even at that earlier stage of development, if it's causing them pain, that's horrible. And that might be their on-ramp or their, their window into seeing the larger evil that's taking place. Um, so to have these conversations is vital. I think that it, it reminds me of, um, you know, when when slavery was an issue. And so the stories that would go around about the cruel treatment of slaves for those who had not seen or experienced slavery, that got their attention. And that began the nation talking in a very important way towards ending a, a larger evil that was being done. But the fact of this inflicting of, of pain or, or, or suffering upon them, that was the on-ramp into seeing the larger picture that slavery itself was evil. Likewise, um, we have that happening here. And in terms of the the legislation that's coming up, I do think that it is an important step um, toward ultimately limiting that evil or doing away with it as we work toward abortion being made illegal. So even though it's important to the big picture, why would it be that focusing on Mm -hmm. pain capability ultimately would fail as an argument against abortion? Yeah, I think that word ultimately is important because, again, it's an important conversation. But simply said, ultimately, abortion isn't wrong because it causes pain. Like that, like as I said, that would be an, an additional evil or an exceptional evil. Abortion is wrong because it intentionally kills innocent human beings. Um, I think I, I define abortion when I talk about it to students or to audiences. I know I defined it in the article, and I typically use Christopher Kayser, who's a wonderful ethicist, um, his definition of abortion, which is intentionally killing the human fetus. Um, That definition begs no questions across the board. I have pro-choice friends who are fine with that definition, um, and I have pro-life friends who are fine with it too. They would just rather call the fetus a baby. Um, But because the science that we talked about a minute ago demonstrates that the unborn are indeed human beings from that moment of conception and philosophy that 
we I know that Christian Research Journal has talked about it often before. We talk about that SLED acronym quite often, that, that there's no morally relevant difference between the embryo and us that would justify killing you or me back then, but not now. And we point to the areas of size and level of development and environment and degree of dependency, all from Stephen Schwartz. Um, but he just he was saying these categories aren't good enough justifications to say that the embryo can be killed, but not us. Um, so philosophy would demonstrate that there's no difference, no real difference between the embryo and us that would justify killing the embryo. But these arguments are all in place to demonstrate that abortion does intentionally kill innocent human beings. That's why it's wrong. And when we're arguing against it, we have to make our way there or we have to go straight there to show this is really what we're saying. What is, you mentioned this in your article, why don't you tell our listeners what um, SEPA is? Oh yeah, um, well SEPA is an acronym, so it stands for actually a medical condition. Um, it stands for congenital insensitivity to pain, and that A on the end, if it's SEPA, uh, some patients who have congenital insensitivity to pain also have it with anhydrosis, so that's just a, an additional part. So SEPA, as an acronym, is a condition where the patient who has SEPA, their brains don't receive the signals that they are experiencing pain or even temperature changes. So if they were to touch a hot stove or put their hand over an open flame, their brain wouldn't be receiving the signal that it's burning them. Um, so it's actually a really dangerous condition. I even mentioned a, a young girl, Ashlyn Blocker, in the article. And um, there are several articles you can find online about her from a handful of years ago. She has this condition. Um, and it was, it was kind of an interesting thing for her upbringing. The very thing that we're trying to avoid, this pain, is the thing that could keep her safer uh, if she could experience it. But the point of bringing it into the discussion is that the assumption with this pain-capable argument for those who would say that, well, the fetus isn't a valuable person until it can experience pain, or abortion should not be allowed after the fetus can experience pain. The assumption there is that there is something value giving or something that would um, qualify kind of a mere human, maybe at the embryo stage or the early fetal stage, to be a valuable person who cannot be harmed. There's something valuable about the experience of pain or the capability to experience pain. So the question there is, what is so value giving about experiencing pain in the first place? If we're going to say that the fetus is disqualified because it can't experience pain in a meaningful way, as these authors have stated, like in the salon piece, and as others are stating in conversations about um, fetal pain capability. If we're going to say that, then we disqualify them from valuable humanity, but we also disqualify whole other classes of humans like Ashlyn Blocker and those who have SEPA um, who experience pain maybe differently than you and I do or not at all. Um, so we wind up right back into kind of Punchinello's world we talked about in the beginning where we have this spectrum that we've created. If pain capability is the value-giving thing, then we have a world where some human beings are not going to matter as much as others because we experience pain very differently. Um, in fact, I talk about that in the article and even kind of point out simple illustrations of how that is. You know, I, I might stub my toe and that be the only thing you know, that I can think about, but I don't, the other day I was kind of scraping ice off of my windshield because I live here in ice cold Colorado. It's very cold right now. And I'm a Georgia girl originally. So this is all new and hard for me. Um, but I was scraping ice off the windshield and got in my car. And a few minutes later, I noticed that my knuckle was, had been bleeding for all this time. And, and I wasn't, I wasn't aware of it. It wasn't bothering me. Um, so even in my own self, I experienced pain differently at different times for different reasons. But that doesn't mean my value as a person fluctuates up and down. Um, so when we talk about SEPA in the article, that's the reason, is if we can demonstrate that all of us experience pain differently, and especially these patients into adulthood, um, even though their lives may be more dangerous than some, so some don't make it that long because they aren't able to tell when something is wrong with their body from pain, um, they're not less of a person because of that. So we can't say that the unborn human beings are less of persons either because of that. I want to go back a little bit to where we were talking earlier about the science. And so for those people 
who argue that, you know, fetuses can't experience pain in the same way that, you know, adults can. What do you think is driving their distinction? And then how can we respond to someone who has this view? Gotcha. Um, yeah, it's kind of a tricky distinction, but here's where the the conversation is is kind of flying by one another. So when these scientists from the Salon article are talking about experiencing pain in a meaningful way, and the author there, um, she kind of makes a distinction between the fetal responses to what we would call painful stimuli at that earlier stage where she says they can't yet experience pain in a meaningful way. Those responses are simply reflexive responses. They're not experiential responses. In other words, what she's saying is that the wiring of the fetus's brain at that earlier stage of development is not to the point where they can consciously experience pain, or at least this is her claim, at that point in time in the way that you and I might consciously experience pain, like when I stubbed my toe and I was talking about it a minute ago. Um, But that's kind of a a distinction that is resting in a, a, a view of what it means to be human that is not the Christian view. Um, So this might take things to a a slightly different level than even the article does, but it's worth mentioning. So, you know, there are different views out there on what it means to be human. And the one that really kind of drives the abortion debate or or that allows for abortion to happen, generally speaking, is one that kind of separates the person from their physical body. So it's a view that says that the true self isn't like you, Melanie, as I experience you, you know, your, your body and what you look like and then your soul that inhabits it. But rather, it's this uh, feelings-based center, or as Robert George might call it, the, the psyche. That's the true self. And the body is simply this machine that exists to serve that true self. So it's not really part of who you are um, based on this view. It's more of a, it's a, it's a machine that you can do to and with kind of what you want if it brings satisfaction or fulfillment to the true self. And I guess the formal name for this is um, body self-dualism, or some people call it body-mind dualism. Some even call it a new Gnosticism because it's very much like that first century view that the church defeated that said that the material world was less than. Um, But it separates the person from the body and even kind of demeans the body to this lower status of not, not mattering as much. So when it comes to abortion, how that might manifest is that for someone who has bought that view, whether it's been absorbed from the culture around them or, 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 or what have you, um, the thinking goes something like, this entity, this part of my biology only matters in as much as I give it value and meaning. Um, and so it comes to the point where a person, based on their true self and this body-mind dualism view, can can kind of say, well, um, I, I can deny even my own biology to some extent. With that, when it comes to the pain capable uh, conversation, they're trying to say, or this this author was trying to say, this doctor, that somehow this wrong is only happening, this pain is only happening to the fetus if they can consciously experience it. In other words, if you're messing with them and they're not consciously experiencing it, you're not really doing anything wrong to them because it lies in the assumption that the true self is that psyche. But we know that I can be wronged even when I haven't experienced it consciously. Anyway, that's what it comes back to. So when it comes to this, there's a view lurking underneath it about what it means to be human that separates the person from the body and is very different from the Christian view. And that's kind of what's in play here at a more deeper level. Well, at the end of your article, you go back to that children's story, to Punchinello's story. So why do you do that? What what do you want the readers to learn from him? Yeah, well, I want the readers to learn exactly what I learned from him. And, and for me, I've got to make sense of all of this information. So what we find is that with Punchinello, he is looking around one day and he sees another Wemmick. Her name is Lucia, and um, she doesn't have any stickers on. And so he becomes very curious about this other Wemmick and wants to know, why aren't you wearing any stickers? And in fact, he begins to notice that when other people try to stick stickers on her, whether it be stars because they admire her or dots because they don't like her for some reason, the stickers fall off every time. And so Lucia tells uh, Punchinello that the reason she doesn't have any stickers is a simple one. She goes to see Eli every day. 
And Eli is the woodworker who lives at the top of the hill. And so Punchinello becomes curious and goes to visit him. And when he does, he discovers that this woodworker not only knows his name, but knows his name because he's his maker. And um, when Punchinello begins asking him about Lucia, why doesn't she have any stickers? You know, Eli uh, responds to him and says, Punchinello, Lucia has decided that what I think is more important than what they think. See, the stickers only stick if they matter to you. And the more you trust in my love, the less the stickers matter. The beautiful thing about this story is that it grasps the difference, the very difference we're talking about here, a difference between a value that is attributed to someone, like the stickers that people put on you to say, this is why we think you matter, versus an intrinsic dignity that was endowed to them by their maker. Um, In this case, Punchinello already matters. Eli made him and Eli loves him. And the more that he trusts in that, the stickers won't stick as much anymore because they won't matter to him as much anymore. Um, he'll know that he's worthy. Um, and at the end of the day, that, that's what the Christian worldview says. It never separates you from your body um, in terms of your existence. It, your body's an essentially part of who you are and what you do to and with it does affect you. And we see that even in the studies around us, that resonates with the world that we see. Um, people are hurt by abortion. Um, you know, whether they're willing to talk about it or not, it causes an immense amount of pain. People are hurt by the things that they do to and with their bodies, thinking that it will be um, nothing or no big deal. And then it is. Um, things like you know, sexual ethics, we could talk about all of that. We see that the Christian worldview is telling us a better story about who we are and why we matter. And the more that we can adopt that, um, the better off we will be. That, in fact, that's my favorite part of the story, Melanie, is that at the end, Punchinello doesn't quite understand it all the way. He kind of walks out of Eli's workshop scratching his head, and he says something like, I think he really meant it. And then one of his dots falls off, but just one. Um, and I think that reminds us of how tricky grace can be and why we have to be reminded of the gospel every single day about who we are, who God is, and why we matter. Um, But to the degree that we understand a little more each time, we're better able and more effective each time um, to be a voice for those who can't speak for themselves. Well, finally, I want to ask Megan some fun rapid fire questions. So Starbucks or any barista, I guess, or make your own coffee. Ooh, um, make my own because I love my house. I love being in my home and reading my book with my coffee. But there are some awesome coffee shops here in Colorado. (laughs) So that's a tough one. Are you a neat freak or a messy person? It depends. I will go probably more neat freak because my mind is a jumbled mess sometimes if you couldn't get that from talking all over the place. Um, So I need my space to be in order. (laughs) And are you adventurous or cautious? Oh, I I probably want to think of myself as adventurous, but if I'm being honest, I'm more cautious. I like to weigh my risks and then be adventurous. And what is something on your bucket list? Hmm. It's just something. I have so many things on my bucket list. Um, I want to go to Ireland. I've never been. Well, thanks, Megan, for being a guest on the Postmodern Realities Podcast. Thank you, Melanie. It's so much fun to talk to you. You're listening to the Postmodern Realities Podcast from the Christian Research Institute and the Christian Research Journal. Today's guest has been Megan Almon, and she has a feature-length article in our current print edition, volume 42, number three and four, and her article is called, What's Pain Got to Do With It? Why Arguments Over Fetal Pain Capability Ultimately Miss the Mark in the Abortion Debate. And we're going to do something we normally do not do. As I mentioned earlier, we're going to make this article completely free online at our website, equip.org, to give you a little sample of what you can expect in the print magazine. And we'd like to invite you to subscribe to the print magazine. Please go to equip.org and subscribe for thirty three fifty. And thank you for your partnership with us. We'd like to hear from you, so connect with us on social media, like the Bible Answer Man Facebook page, and follow CRI, Christian Research Journal, Hank Hanegraaff, and the Bible Answer Man on Twitter. And please subscribe to the Bible Answer Man channel on YouTube. If you like this episode, please subscribe to the Postmodern Realities Podcast on iTunes, and please rate and review our podcast. When you rate and review our podcast, it helps others see our content. And please share this episode on your social media accounts. 
Be sure you tune in daily to the Bible Answer Man broadcast hosted by CRI President Hank Hanegraaff, who answers your questions live on air. To ask Hank a question, call 888-ASK-HANK, Monday through Friday at 6 p.m. Eastern Time. In addition, head to iTunes and subscribe to Hank Unplugged, Hank's audio podcast. Follow Hank off the grid, where he has in-depth conversations with some of the brightest minds discussing topics you care about. So until our next Christian Research Journal author conversation, thanks for listening to the Postmodern Realities Podcast.